Well, hi there. These are insect feeders sent to us by the sponsor of this video, dubiaroaches.com. We even have a discount code from them in the description if you want to order some feeders yourself. But we have a lot of different types of feeders right here, and I want to discuss some of the pros and cons of each. And I'm also gonna organize them phylogenetically because I'm into that kind of thing. So let's take a look at these awesome and edible feeder insects and how they're related. In the past, you've heard me discuss two big groups of insects, the hemimetabola and the holometabola, and the fundamental difference between these two groups, that difference being complete or incomplete metamorphosis. Hemimetabolous insects hatch from eggs as nymphs. Nymphs look and act generally very much like smaller, wingless versions of adults. Every time they molt their exoskeleton, they molt into larger and larger nymphs until their last molt, when they emerge as generally winged adults. Hollow metabolous insects follow a very different pattern. Hollow metabolous insects hatch out as larvae, which differ from nymphs in that they generally look almost nothing like the adults. Many look somewhat worm-like, and they generally molt into larger and larger worms until they molt, not into an adult just yet, but into a pupa. These pupae are non-feeding and generally non-ambulatory. They just hang out until they're ready to molt into a generally winged adult that looks almost nothing like the larval form. This is complete metamorphosis. And all of this is accurate, but as it turns out, the hollow metabola is nested within the hemimetabola. This means that the ancestors of the hollow metabolous insects likely were hemimetabolous insects. And the hollow metabolous insects are more closely related to some hemimetabolous insects than those hemimetabolous insects are to other hemimetabolous insects. Hollow metabola is a monophyletic group, but hemimetabola is not because hollow metabola falls right into the middle of it. It is what you would call a paraphyletic group, like lizards without snakes or reptiles without birds. That said, on our phylogeny of feeders, the hemimetabolous insects are all more closely related to one another than any of them are to the hollow metabolous insects. This is thanks in no small part to the fact that none of our feeders are hemipterans, the true bugs, which are hemimetabolous insects that are more closely related to the hollow metabolous insects than they are to the other hemimetabolous insects. In our feeder tree, we have two clades of hemimetabolous insects. These two clades would be the blatteria, the cockroaches, and the orthoptera, the jumping guys, like grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids. As the sponsor of today's video is dubiaroaches.com, I just think it makes sense to start with the roaches. These right here are my two favorite cockroach species to keep. First are the dubia roaches. This is my favorite of all feeders. I love them for many reasons. One being that they're highly nutritious and easy to gut load or feed foods that you want to get into your pet right before you feed them to your pet. Also, being hemimetabolous insects that get big but are born small, they come in a wide diversity of sizes, from tiny nymph to two inch long adult. They are easy and quiet to breed, they just need heat. And that need for heat, combined with little ability to climb smooth surfaces, means that you're unlikely to have a dubia infestation in your home. Plus, they're basically unable to do any harm at all to your pets. The only downsides are that they are cockroaches and have a certain stigma associated with them, and they're illegal in some places, like Florida. They also bury themselves quickly in substrate, making it possible that they will escape being eaten and just take up residence in the enclosure. Tongue feeding or using a dish can reduce this risk. Their closest relatives among the feeders we have here today are the Madagascar hissing cockroaches. I love hissing cockroaches, and these are probably the biggest hissing cockroaches I've ever seen. I love them so much that I view them as pets, not feeders. I mean, these ha are the current record holders for the highest scoring pet we've ever reviewed on this channel. I, I just don't view them as, as food. So these, these guys here have landed in the right place. You're safe here, little friend. But I'm a weirdo. There is no objective reason that it's okay to feed dubias and not hissers. The big advantage to hissers over dubias is that they are bigger. 
But their exoskeletons are tougher to digest, they have some protective spikes, and they can climb smooth surfaces. Otherwise, they have many of the same benefits as dubias. And they may be available where dubias are not. The other clade of hemimetabolous insects represented here today are the orthopterans. You know, the guys with big hopper legs. This is a grasshopper. Odds are that you've encountered them in your life. I think grasshoppers are a fantastic feeder. In some places, they're very common as feeders, but I've never lived in one of those places. This is another hemimetabolous insect that comes in a range of sizes. But unlike dubias, they do not generally bury themselves. Grasshoppers are jumpers, not hiders. The downsides are that they can be difficult to get, and that they need more specialized care to keep long term and to breed than dubias. I do not recommend feeding wild feeders to your pets as they may have been exposed to toxins or parasites that can harm your pets. Grasshoppers are nutritious, wonderful feeders if you have access to them captive bred. And they're much quieter than their closest relative that we have here, crickets. Good jump. I have a real love-hate relationship with crickets. In some ways, they are great feeders. They're easy to gut load, easy to get, and they tend to be explorers, which generally ends terribly for them. But they are loud. You've, you've been hearing them this entire video. It's not going to stop. They are so loud. They're also smelly and often short-lived. I pretty much buy crickets in quantities that I will use within about 24 hours. Though I have bred them in the past, which is totally doable, it's just loud and smelly. And it's not worth it when they're so available and relatively inexpensive. This is the cheapest and chirpiest feeder we have discussed so far. There are really even about two species that you find now. One of them are house crickets, which are the ones that you, you're probably most used to seeing. They have a more stereotypical call. But it's my understanding that they're a little bit less nutritious and a little bit louder and maybe a little bit smellier and harder to keep than a cricket that I have seen growing in popularity quite a lot recently, which are banded crickets, which a lot of people love, but I like less. I like them less. They may be quieter, but I find their call to be really irritating. Where the normal cricket call is sort of like camping. Their call is just sort of like continuous obnoxious noise. On top of that, I find them to be much more athletic. So like if I reach into a bag of, of house crickets, I can grab a handful and throw them in with feeders. No problem. If I reach in with the banded crickets, they coat my hand and then they leap off and into all kinds of crazy directions and they're fast and they're just harder to manipulate and deal with because they're so good at holding on to you. And I don't know if that's for everyone. It's, it's a creepy experience if you're not prepared for it. I don't like crickets. They've both got their pros and cons, but they're also probably one of the most common feeders I use. And that brings us to the hollow metabola. If you're enjoying this video so far and would like to see more content like this in the future, please subscribe to our channel. And if you want to order some feeder insects yourself, please don't forget to check out our sponsor, DubiaRoaches.com, who has made this video possible. And remember, we have a discount code down in the description, so might as well save some money. But as it turns out, the hollow metabola are the most successful group of animals, at least in terms of the number of species of any group on the planet. And this is largely because the juveniles and the adults do not compete directly for resources. Being the most speciose group of animals on the planet, it may come as no surprise that the majority of our feeders come from this group as well. And the first two are both members of the most successful group within the hollow metabola, the beetles. They do not look much like beetles because they are juveniles. These are mealworms and superworms. They are not only both beetles, but they are both members of the same family of beetles, Tenebrionidae. These are two of my favorite feeders. One of my favorite things about them is that it is very easy to keep them alive for a long time. So they're a great feeder to always have on hand just in case you can't get away to buy feeders for a bit. They also travel through the mail very nicely. I order them by the thousands and lose very few. They are quiet, 
and like the crickets. They don't smell bad. And they're pretty nutritious, assuming that they can be digested. That exoskeleton is pretty tough to process. This is the main insect feeder that I find regurgitated occasionally. And so far, I've been talking about them like they're the same thing, because other than the fact that superworms are much larger than mealworms, they are pretty similar as feeders. But there are some important differences in their care. For one, unless you're planning to breed them, which is very doable, you don't want them to metamorphose into beetles. The way to prevent this differs between mealworms and superworms. Mealworms you simply keep in the refrigerator. This slows their metabolism, their rate of food consumption, their rate of defecation, and their rate of development. If you want to breed them, simply keep them at room temperature. Superworms do not need and should not be refrigerated. You should keep them at room temperature, but they will not metamorphose until they're alone, so it shouldn't be a problem. That said, if you want to breed them, you need to isolate the larvae into individual containers so they will pupate. They're both great feeders, but probably not a great staple for most animals due to their difficult to digest exoskeletons. The remaining hollow metabolist insect feeders we have here are more closely related to one another than they are to anything we've discussed so far, including the beetles. The last clade itself contains two clades of excellent feeders. The first are the moths of the clade Lepidoptera, which contains three great feeders. These are all moths, though I wouldn't fault you if you didn't recognize them as such, because they are juveniles. These would be hornworms, the tobacco hawk moth of the family Sphingidae, silkworms, the domestic silk moth of the family Bombycidae, and waxworms, the greater wax moth of the family Pyralidae. Of the three, the most distantly related are the waxworms. These are a great feeder that is most commonly used as a treat or to fatten up emaciated animals. They are very high in fat and are subsequently delicious. The concept of getting too many calories in your diet is something known only to humans in certain places in recent history and their pets. Historically, this has never been a problem. People in the afterlife will simply not understand when they find out that you died as a result of eating too many calories. So your pets will likely love waxworms, but you need to regulate their use as to not give your pet something difficult to explain to their peers in the afterlife. Unlike the beetle larvae that we just discussed, waxworms are soft and easy to digest. There is a lot to love about waxworms, as long as you only feed them to animals in moderation. I do, however, usually only buy them when I need them. It is very possible to maintain a colony, and the moths make great feeders as well, unlike the beetles, but they don't stay larvae for very long. Only buy them in quantities that you'll use in about a week, unless you can store them at about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, then they can last a couple of months. Much cooler kills them, but much warmer, turns them into moths very quickly. The two most closely related moths are the silkworms, which are larval domestic silk moths, and the hornworms, which are the larvae of the tobacco hawk moth. Silkworms are one of the less well-known feeder insects, and yet often touted as one of the best. Like waxworms, they are soft-bodied and easy to digest, but they only have about 1 20th of the fat of waxworms. So if you're trying to get nutrients into your pet without all of the calories, these are a spectacular option. They also get considerably larger, which is very nice. They're a great option for helping an obese reptile drop some weight. So they're like opposite waxworms, but they are expensive and they can be difficult to find. DubiaRoaches.com can help with those problems though, especially if you use our discount code. But this is a feeder that doesn't provide a heck of a lot of calories. These are a great supplemental feeder, but I wouldn't recommend them as a staple unless your animal is obese and looking to shed some inches. If you want an alternative that gets even a little bit bigger, their closest relative on the list, hornworms, the larvae of the tobacco hawk moth, is a fantastic option. These are ginormous. They are like an easier to digest version of dubia roaches, with about half the calories. So kind of a diet dubia. 
But I do want to give a quick PSA about these. While I do not encourage you to feed wild insects to your pets, period, this is astronomically important with hornworms. In the wild, these feed on nightshades. This means that they are super toxic. These hornworms from dubiaroaches.com were fed on a different diet and are, as a result, not toxic. Do not feed wild caught hornworms to anything you would rather see alive. Okay, that said, captive bred and raised hornworms are great. They range dramatically in size, starting actually really quite small and getting enormous. They are a wonderful low calorie treat for your reptiles and are easy to keep as they are usually sent in cups that include everything they will need. They probably aren't too hard to breed either, but I've never done it myself. If you do want to find out more about breeding moths though, you should check out our video on silk moths. The biggest pain with these guys is just that you need to clean out their droppings regularly, which is pretty easy because they pretty much fall out. Other than that, and being a bit expensive, they're just great. And that brings us to the last clade of feeder insects that we are going to discuss today, the dipterans, flies, which are voluptuous, I've heard. Diptera refers to the fact that they have two wings, whereas most insects have four. Now they do actually have four wings, but the second set are modified into little whirling gyros called halteers. So they only have two that are used to generate lift, and the other two are small and are used for stability. Anyway, there are a few different flies that are common as feeders. And included among them are the Drosophila fruit flies and black soldier fly larvae. Fruit flies are an absolute must if you keep poison dart frogs, but are a great option for really any sort of animal that requires very small feeders. It's usually the adults that are used as feeders, and a couple of different species are available based on the size that you need. Drosophila melanogaster are the smaller fruit flies, and Drosophila hydei are larger, though still pretty small. Honestly, if you need a smaller feeder than these, you probably just want to get springtails, which would go right here on our phylogeny. They are hexapods, like insects, but they aren't actually part of the insect clade which is why they aren't in this video. Drosophila melanogaster is about the smallest insect feeder that you can get. And since they are so widely used in genetics research, we're very good at keeping them. We have great food mixes for them, and they're easy to keep and breed for many generations. They're even available in flightless morphs, though be sure not to mix flightless morphs, because there are multiple of them and they are different. And if you mix them, what you get is a bunch of flighted fruit flies. Uh, those don't work very well as feeders, and they do get everywhere. Really, the only downside to fruit flies is learning to time your colonies so that they emerge as the last one finishes up, and to know what to do when your colony collapses, which can and will occur at some point. I have a love-hate relationship with fruit flies, and I would be willing to make a whole video about them in the future if you're into that kind of thing. But let's talk now about black soldier fly larvae. They're maggots and they go by a host of names with their own registered trademarks. At dubiaroaches.com, they carry nutric rubs, and these larval flies are calcium powerhouses. I'm gonna put up a table of nutrition information from dubiaroaches.com right here. Pause the video if you need a longer look. In most ways, they are pretty much like other feeders. They're soft-bodied and easy to digest. They're on the smaller side, but not tiny, and they have more than 11 times more calcium per unit mass than the next most calcium rich feeder. And this can really help prevent or even correct metabolic bone disease, MBD, which can be debilitating or even fatal for your pets. I always recommend calcium supplementation, but natural sources like this are even better. And all you need to do with them is keep them in the refrigerator and feed them to your pets. The only real downsides are that they are gross looking maggots and they don't get very large. That said, they're an excellent addition to a balanced diet. And that is a phylogeny of insect feeders. To order or for more information, definitely go and check out dubiaroaches.com. Don't forget our discount code down in the description for this video. And as always, like and subscribe.
and we hope to see you real soon. I spent, for the record, I had to go out and collect my own grasshoppers. I'm gonna yeah. try to breed them here. Really? But uh, I had to collect grasshoppers yesterday for this video. Uh -huh. So I'm out trompsing around through a field catching grasshoppers. And yeah. I was pretty excited that that's my job now. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> gather I've been training for this my whole life, right? Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is my first time as a professional grasshopper and you catcher. you go back to younger Clint catching grasshoppers in his yard. What yeah. you say to him? I'll be like, this will be your job someday, son. Yeah. Carry on. <laughs> one being that they're highly nutrition. One being that they're highly. Highly. One being that they're highly. Highly. I'll try this one more time. Then I'll just change the lines. <laughs> Go away, fly. This isn't your video. This is other flies' video. <laughs>